Start. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to introduce today Soren Larsen, who is faculty member at the Radboud University in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, since 2012. Soren obtained his PhD in 1999 in a collaboration between uh, the University of Copenhagen in Denmark and uh, Bonn in Germany. He was a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz in uh, California, the United States from um, 2000 till 2002. Uh, and then he moved to Garking in Germany to be an ESO fellow and an SDSCI instrument scientist at the Space Telescope European Coordinating Facility. Be before moving to Nijmegen on his current position, he spent six years as a faculty member at the Astronomical Institute in Utrecht, the Netherlands. Thank you so much, Soren, for accepting your invitation. You may start when you're ready. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna, for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. Can you hear me all right and see the presentation there? Very good. Yes. So I'm going to talk, uh, as it says here, about some work that we've been doing on chemical abundances of extragalactic globular clusters. So we have some new results to show there, and uh, that also includes uh, a, a surprise uh, that we came across uh, uh, during this work. So at the bottom of the screen there, you see uh, some people that have been involved in this work over the years. Uh, undoubtedly, that is an incomplete list. So I apologize to anyone who might see this and uh, feel that their name should have been mentioned there. Now I'm gonna go back to the very basics here. It's already always good to start from the beginning. Um, and uh, we can already find uh, Aristotle uh, talking about stars and uh, that it is uh, interesting to talk about their composition uh, and their shapes and their movements. <clears throat> I think to some extent, this uh, still actually represents uh, quite nicely a lot of the work that's being done on, uh, astro in astronomy, at least on stellar astronomy in our own galaxy as well as other galaxies. Now, of course, we know quite a bit more about these things now than uh, the ancient Greek uh, scientists or philosophers did uh, two and a half thousand years ago. We don't think anymore that the, the fundamental elements are earth and water and fire and air. And we also don't think that uh, the stars consist of some uh, fifth element that has nothing to do with uh, the other four elements uh, that uh, they were talking about back then. In fact, um, one of the rather striking results uh, of the last century or so is that there are some quite remarkable similarities between the chemical composition that you see in stars and in the Earth's crust. Uh, Cecilia Payne, of course, was one of uh, the people that pioneered this field in her famous PhD thesis from 1925. Uh, and so the fact that you have these similarities uh, also means that uh, if we want to understand where we come from, where all the air that we breathe uh, comes from and the elements that make up uh, our bodies, everything around us basically, uh, that also means uh, uh, understanding where the stars come from, how chemical elements build up over time and so on. So I think you can motivate this kind of work here in a very basic way uh, by saying that it's about understanding where we actually come from. Um, it's also good to recognize, of course, that uh, the work that uh, Cecilia Payne did and that we are still doing today, continuing rests on a lot of work that's been done uh, by other branches of physics in order to make sense of an astronomical spectrum. Uh, you need to uh, understand uh, the atomic physics and the quantum mechanics and so on to convert measurements of line strength into chemical abundances and so on. Uh, so that is still true today that the results that you are getting, uh, they're going to be no better than the input physics that you're using when you do the analysis. Okay, so that's uh, about doing these measurements. Why do we actually do them? <clears throat> of course, there's also the aspect of connecting this to astrophysics in general. Uh, um, what are the sources? What are the sites where uh, elements are actually produced? and a return to the, uh, um, to the interstellar medium and then incorporated in subsequent generations of stars. So this is a kind of slide uh, that you might uh, have seen 
in some course on uh, galactic uh, chemical evolution uh, or uh, on astronomy in, astronomy in general, perhaps. Um, so uh, what is shown here are the abundances of uh, different chemical elements uh, in supernovae of type two and supernovae of type one relative to the solar chemical composition here. So uh, we can see that in the type two supernovae on the top there, uh, we get a lot of these so-called alpha elements here, uh, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, and so on. Uh, and in the type 1a supernovae, uh, instead, uh, there is a lot of iron peak elements produced. So if you look at the relative proportions of uh, these different kinds of elements in stars, you can learn something about the relative importance of the different enrichment mechanisms. And since these different enrichment mechanisms operate on different time scales, that uh, gives you information about the time scales for chemical enrichment. And so these time scales are interesting uh, to compare with uh, the kind of time scales that might come out of models for galaxy uh, formation. Right? Uh, and they are quite complementary in the sense that the, the time scales for chemical enrichment are not necessarily the same as the timescales on which uh, galaxies might uh, assemble, merge with each other and so on, right? So the, the Milky Way chemical enrichment, for example, uh, has proceeded over the entire lifetime of the Milky Way. We are still having uh, stars forming in the disk, uh, although the, the merger history of uh, the Milky Way was much more active early on. So this is a very complementary piece of the picture uh, and where uh, I think there is a, uh, where it would be good to see uh, a lot more predictions uh, by some of the simulations that we have for galaxy formation that we can compare with the data. Now, this is just a, a very simplified picture. Of course, uh, there are other enrichment mechanisms than just type 1 and type 2 supernovae, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Also, type 2 supernovae are not just one type of event uh, that depends on the mass and the chemical composition, probably things like rotation of the progenitor star. And there is also some discussion about whether type 1a supernovae are really a homogeneous class of the object. Okay, so if you look at the Milky Way, uh, if you look at the abundance ratios of different elements as a function of metallicity, this is the general picture that we see. So at the low metallicities over on, on the left side here, so this is solar metallicity here, right? One, but uh, 10%, 1% and so on down to very low metallicities. There you see that the alpha elements are enhanced by about a factor of two compared to the composition that we see in the sun, uh, scaling the iron abundance accordingly, right? So uh, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, so on, they are all uh, enhanced by a factor of two compared to iron relative to the composition that we see in the sun. So that tells us that at least low metallicities, the enrichment happened uh, uh, with a more important contribution for uh, these type two supernovae uh, that occur on short time scales, right? So it make, makes, makes sense that they would dominate early on in the evolutionary history of the galaxy. And then at some point you get this knee here in the Milky Way that happens at uh, an iron abundance of uh, minus one on the logarithm, on, on log, uh, logarithmic scale. Uh, then the supernova 1a uh, kick in and uh, the abundance ratios start to approach uh, what you have in the sun. Um, the actual picture, uh, if you look in more detail, then becomes a, a lot more complex uh, than what you saw in the previous slide. We start to be able to identify different components of a galaxy also in chemical space here. So here you see that uh, in this diagram of alpha to iron ratio versus metallicity, the thick disk and the thin disk, they separate out. And you can also identify uh, this group of stars over here, the Gaia and Celadus event, that is probably the remnant of some early accretion or merger event. Um, so that is the case for the Milky Way. Uh, of course, we would like to be able to do these kind of observations also for other galaxies. And so that is what I'm going to be leading up to uh, in a minute. Uh, first, uh, let me just say that uh, beyond just uh, simple alpha elements versus iron comparisons, there are various other tracers that one can look at uh, that trace different processes. So here's one example, barium. Uh, 
uh, which is produced, uh, it's an S process element, right? So the slow neutron capture process uh, is responsible for creating barium by, by capturing uh, neutrons onto uh, lighter nuclei beyond the iron peak. And this happens predominantly in AGB stars here. We can see that when we compare the barium to iron ratio in the Milky Way with measurements for LMC stars, there is quite a significant difference there, which suggests that there's something different about the chemical enrichment history in the LMC, probably having to do with a, a more a, a stronger contribution from AGB stars, at least at intermediate ages and metallicities, right? So these are stars mostly in the in the, uh, in the bar and in the disk of the LMC. So barium is another example of this, uh, how you can try to deduce something about the enrichment history of a galaxy. There are others. Sodium uh, is an element that will come up again through the talk here. It has a quite complex history because it can be formed in a type two supernovae. And that's probably where most of the sodium uh, that we see in stars in the field uh, was formed, but it can also be produced in AGB stars. Um, and so that becomes interesting in the context of globular clusters where you have these anti-correlations between certain elements, like it is written here, sodium and oxygen. So that may tell us something about internal processes in globular clusters that we don't really understand. Uh, but also when you compare different galaxies, you again see differences in the amount of sodium that they have. So here are data for the Milky Way compared with data in some dwarf galaxies. The red points here, I think, are, the, uh, the, uh, are for the four next dwarf galaxy. So at a given metallicity, there is a difference between the amount of sodium that you see in four next dwarf and in the Milky Way. Probably uh, for the field stars here, that is probably related again to the relative importance of type uh, 1a and type 2 supernovae. And then finally, an element here that may be a little bit more obscure to uh, a lot of people, manganese. It's an iron peak element located, in fact, right next to iron in the periodic table, number 25. So you might expect that it is produced in a way that is quite similar to iron. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, it is believed that manganese is produced mainly in type 1a uh, supernovae. But the interesting thing about manganese is that the manganese yields are very sensitive to the mass of the white dwarf before, right before it, explode, either it explodes as a supernova. So if it has a mass very close to the Chandrasekhar mass, then you tend to get higher manganese yields than if the mass uh, differs more from the Chandrasekhar mass. So uh, manganese may tell you something interesting about the properties of type 1a supernova progenitors. So that's a little bit uh, of motivation here. Uh, and uh, the measurements that I've shown you so far, they are mostly for individual stars uh, in the Milky Way and in a few nearby galaxies. And that's why you can do these measurements. Uh, when you go to more distant galaxies, uh, it becomes much more challenging to derive detailed abundances. Uh, you can do something with integrated galaxy light, uh, even at low, relatively low spectral resolution. Some of these features can still be observed. Um, but the problem with integrated galaxy light is that um, you lose information, right? You have some mix of stellar populations with potentially different uh, ages and compositions and so on. So that can make it a little bit harder to interpret. Uh, that's why. Uh, uh, we have settled on using globular clusters as an intermediate step between the stars and, uh, and the, the, the whole galaxies. So globular clusters, you can still observe individually uh, out to greater distances than at least old RGB stars, right? Just because a globular cluster consists of hundreds of thousands or even millions of stars, uh, they are observable out to greater distances and you can still get good uh, spectra of them. Uh, yet they still have distinct ages, distinct chemical compositions. So they are discrete sampling points in principle in age and, uh, um, and chemical composition and so on. Um, <clears throat> so over the past uh, several years, we've been collecting integrated light spectra of globular clusters in the local group in a, and in a few cases, a little bit beyond that, um, down to a magnitude of uh, about 18 or so 
uh, which is a, a sort of a practical limit. Uh, if a cluster is brighter than that, you can still get a good spectrum in a few hours of integration time with an instrument like UVIS on the VLT or HIRIS on the Keck uh, telescopes. Um, so these are just some images of the galaxies uh, that we have uh, observed. Uh, and over here on the left, you see a list of uh, elements that we measure from these spectra. I'm not going to discuss all of them in detail, don't worry, but uh, if you have a favorite element that you're interested in, uh, maybe you will see it on the list here and feel free uh, to, uh, to ask it uh, about it later and discuss it if you like. Uh, so before I go to the results, I will say a little bit about how uh, we actually do these measurements. Um, so uh, we are using high dispersion spectrographs, uh, but still uh, when you take a spectrum of a globular cluster, the features are going to be broadened and smoothed out by the velocity dispersions in the clusters, which are typically on the order of five to 10 kilometers per second, but can be higher for some of the more massive clusters. And that means that we still have to worry about line blending for uh, many of the lines that are interesting. So here are just a couple of uh, spectra uh, showing some sodium lines. Uh, on the top here, you have a spectrum of 47 Tuck, a well-known bright globular cluster in the Milky Way. And on the bottom, there is a spectrum of Arcturus. Um, uh, yeah, and so what you can see is that uh, these individual sodium lines here that are identifiable in the Arcturus spectrum, they get blended with other lines in the spectrum of 47 Tuck. Right, so here we have a line that is blended with a nickel line. And if you go over to these other lines here, you can see we have a sodium line here that is very strongly blended with some calcium lines in this case here. Uh, so if you would try to determine the chemical abundance of Arcturus uh, or some other red giant, uh, you could uh, measure the individual lines here, measure the equivalent width, and then convert that to an abundance. Uh, but when we talk about globular cluster spectra, uh, we really need to go to uh, the full spectral fitting and calculate synthetic model spectra that take into account this blending here of the different lines. Uh, so just, uh, I think, yeah, it is already written here in the legend, uh, right? And you can probably guess that the black curves here in the background are the observed spectra and the red curves there are the best model fits. So you can see that generally uh, you, you can get quite decent fits. Um, that is not something which is actually uh, trivially true. So um, I mentioned at the beginning uh, that we rely on uh, having good atomic data for the lines that we are trying to measure. And there are compilations of atomic data out there uh, that you can download. So a famous one is the one by Rob Kurus that he is maintaining. There are also others. Uh, the VALD uh, database has data for individual lines. There's the NIST compilation uh, and there's an older line list by Castelli uh, that uh, we have also been using. Now, regardless of which one of these lists that you pick, you will always find that when you compute a synthetic spectrum and compare it with an observed spectrum, there will be some lines that don't match. Um, and if those are the lines that you are interested in, of course, that is a problem, but it can also be a problem even if they are not lines that you, that you are directly trying to measure because they will affect the fit uh, and how the continuum levels of the model versus uh, con uh, synthetic uh, model versus uh, observed spectra are going to be uh, matched with each other. Uh, so here are just a couple of examples to illustrate that. On the top, again, Arcturus here, and on the bottom, the spectrum of the sun. Those are the black curves here, and then there are model spectra calculated with different line lists. By and large, it is not too bad, but there are some cases where it fails catastrophically, like this nickel line over here, that you can see there is basically no observable line here in the, the actual spectrum of, this, of Arcturus or the sun. But if you use the Curus list or also the Castelli list here, you get a line there, which is much too strong. Um, so in this case, we just removed that line and that was pretty easy. In other cases, this is not as straightforward, right? You might have a, a mismatch here. You can see there, this line here actually fits quite nicely. When we use the Curus line list, and then we get this dashed line here, but in the Castelli line list, the line is too weak. And there are other lines where it is the other way around. So it's a lot of uh, 
fairly tedious work to sort all this out. This is just a small fraction, a, a, you know, six angstrom of a spectrum. The total range that we are fitting is something like 1500 angstroms or so. And you get across these kind of things here every few angstrom, one or two angstrom. Uh, so uh, in the line list that we ended up using at the end, the red curve here, uh, we, had, uh, we started with the curious list, but then there were about 600 lines that we had to adjust in order to get the best matches that we could. It doesn't always work out uh, uh, completely well. For example, you have this, complete, this very complex blend here in the middle uh, with many different lines. So, so sometimes you really just have to get up, to give up and say, oh, could we mask out that part of the spectrum? Okay, then we can verify that we're getting the re right results, fitting again, just the sun, see if we get the right uh, abundances out. So here's a comparison of our results from fitting the solar spectrum with the standard references in the literature, Greves and Soval, and also the Asplund et al paper. For most elements, these agree fairly closely. Uh, and we also get similar results within a few hundreds of a dex. There are a few cases where it is a little bit worse. Notice here a zirconium and uranium though, and europium. Those are lines that are very weak in the solar spectrum. Uh, so our line list and our fitting windows where we do these fits are not really optimized for the sun. Uh, if you do the same comparison for Arcturus, it looks quite a bit better, but I'm, you know, I will spare you another table here. This is just to to illustrate uh, the kind of comparisons uh, that we have done and the kind of checks to make sure that you get uh, uh, reliable results. Now that's for individual stars. Uh, a globular cluster uh, has of course uh, uh, many different kinds of stars in it, uh, ranging from main sequence stars up to the subgiant branch and the red giant branch here and also horizontal branch. So to model a globular cluster spectrum, you then have to calculate model spectrum for the individual stars and sum them together with appropriate weights. Uh, so what we typically do is we take an isochrone, but it can also be an empirical color magnitude diagram if that is available uh, and divide that into a hundred bins or so. And then for each star, you have a temperature and a gravity and you can calculate model spectra uh, for a given chemical composition, add them up and see if you get a good fit to the observed spectrum and then uh, adjust the abundances until uh, we get the best fits that we can get. Yeah, so th that's basically how this works. These are, the, these are the codes that we are using for this. And here are just some example fits where you can see that uh, the spectra change, of course, as we go from very low metallicities to very high metallicities here. So these are uh, globular clusters in the Milky Way where we have done this comparison if we just plot up uh, our metallicities versus the literature of metallicities, uh, we do another check uh, that we see here. The blue symbols here are Milky Way globular cluster metallicities from uh, Bill Harris compilation. And the black symbols here are M31 globular cluster metallicities that uh, have been observed by Caldwell collaborators calibrated to fit onto the Milky Way abundance scale as well. But you can see that they go up to a bit higher metallicities there. Uh, the, the message from this plot here is that uh, we get quite good agreement. We don't really see any systematic offsets between the metallicities that we derive from uh, the high dispersion spectroscopy and the ones that are available in the, literature, in the literature from other methods, either individual stars or from a lower dispersion spectroscopy. So that's quite reassuring. Then we can go on and look at a few results here. Um, so let me first show uh, just the alpha elements again, calcium and titanium here. Uh, the colored symbols here are our observations of globular clusters. The gray dots there in the background are in the uh, Milky Way stars, mostly in the solar neighborhood. And the orange dots are uh, stars in the Milky Way bulge, um, lensed stars observed by Bensby and collaborators. So the first the uh, thing that you would notice is that the scatter is actually very small in the globular cluster abundances there. If you look at calcium and titanium, the dispersion is uh, not much larger than the measurement uncertainties on the order of 0.1 dex or so. And in particular, there is no uh, difference that we, as far as you can tell between globular clusters in the Milky Way uh, 
and M31. Those are the, the purple and the black symbols there and, uh, and the dwarf galaxies down here at lower metallicities. They are all enhanced by about a factor of two or so uh, compared to scale solar composition. So that tells us that at least to first order, the chemical enrichment histories of these galaxies must have been quite similar. Now, there are some outliers in the plot here, uh, in particular, these two objects here uh, that I will circle for you here, and I will compare uh, that with measurements of chemical abundances in dwarf galaxies. Uh, this is from the compilation by Tolstoy and collaborators. Uh, that, that it was a review that they wrote uh, back in 2009, again, comparing the Milky Way here with uh, measurements of, uh, for individual stars in various dwarf galaxies. So what you can see is that this knee here that I was talking about in the Milky Way, it has actually now shifted to lower metallicities in the dwarf galaxies. That is something you see uh, quite typically for dwarf galaxies. Uh, so uh, what you would infer from that is that chemical enrichment in a sense proceeded more slowly in the dwarf galaxies. Uh, that probably has to do with uh, them being less able to hold on to, um, to, the, to the gas in the galaxies as star formation goes on, right? So you have more efficient feedback in these dwarf galaxies, meaning that you have galactic winds uh, that carry away some of the metals. Chemical enrichment then proceeds more slowly. And that means that by the, by the time uh, the supernovae of type one start to kick in, the dwarf galaxy uh, uh, interstellar medium has not reached the same level of enrichment as it does in the Milky Way. Now, for the point here of comparing with the globular clusters, uh, you can draw uh, by hand a line through this, and you see that the clusters here in these dwarf galaxies actually follow a very similar trend. Uh, so these are not really outliers. Uh, they just follow the trend uh, that one sees in dwarf galaxies. So that is, again, quite reassuring that we are getting results for globular clusters that are consistent with uh, what is seen also in the field stars. You will notice this other outlier over here that is very metal poor. I'll get back to that in a moment, but that was uh, the surprise uh, that I was talking about in the first slide. Uh, most globular clusters are more metal rich than about minus two and a half on this scale here, but there's this one cluster that we found by accident that is almost down at minus three. So we'll get back, that, back to that in a minute. First, I just want to say a, a little bit about manganese here, because I mentioned that earlier in the talk. Uh, the issue with, uh, well, so, so these are models here showing uh, how manganese might evolve as a function of metallicity for different assumptions about the two, uh, type 1a supernova progenitors. Uh, this model is here for supernovae that have uh, progenitors that have a mass close to the Chandrasekhar mass. Here, instead, they have a sub Chandrasekhar mass when they explode. And the data points here are measurements for individual stars as well as globular clusters. So the globular clusters, uh, those uh, yellow and blue points here, they follow pretty much the same trend as uh, the field stars. And you can see that uh, you can fit both sets of data here. Uh, the top data here I actually fit quite well by this model with uh, Chandrasekhar mass uh, progenitors. And on the bottom here, you can also fit the data, but now using sub Chandrasekhar mass. Now, the difference between these two data sets only have to do with whether non-LCE corrections are being applied or not. Uh, so uh, that is something that we are working on implementing for globular clusters as well. So for manganese, we managed to do that in this paper with Philip Eitner and the Maria Bergemann collaborators in Heidelberg. This is something that is being done more or less on a routine basis for individual stars for quite some time. Uh, but for globular clusters, we are also working on trying to implement these uh, corrections here. Um, so uh, for, we have done that for manganese uh, and magnesium and barium, uh, but there are also other elements uh, that are relevant like sodium, for example. Uh, so this is ongoing work, uh, but in principle, this can be done now. So I could go on and uh, show uh, a lot of other elements. Uh, I'm not really going to do that. What I will do instead is uh, trying to look at the data in a different way, applying a principal component analysis uh, to the uh, measurements that we have here. So this is basically a way of asking how many fundamental 
correlations are there in your data set or what is the true dimensionality of your data set. So you can imagine taking all the measurements of our elements that we have and project them uh, and plot them in some multiple uh, dimensional uh, uh, parameter space. Uh, and then you ask in which planes uh, in this uh, parameter space or along which axis do you have the largest amount of, of variance, right? Then you project the data along that axis and you take out uh, that component uh, and then you continue uh, and reduce the variance that is left in the data set every time. So the first principal component here, not very surprisingly, just come from iron abundance variations. So just differences in overall metallicity. Those are what account for most of the variance in the data set. Not so uh, interesting, perhaps, or surprising. Uh, but the next principal components are then the ones that get a little bit more interesting. You might expect that number two would be the alpha elements, uh, but that is not actually the case. Uh, once we have taken out metallicity variations, most of the remaining variance comes from these elements here. So sodium, you can read down on the uh, y-axis here, on the x-axis, which elements these correspond to each of these bars here. Right? So this is sodium, copper, and uh, and barium, so those are not elements that are typical of uh, supernovae nuclear synthesis. Uh, probably um, we are looking at the differences uh, in AGB nuclear synthesis in these different uh, galaxies instead. So that's quite interesting. Uh, then the next one is the alpha elements here, but you can see the error bars are quite uh, large here. So none of these variations are actually very significant. Most of it is driven by those couple of uh, of globular clusters that uh, were a little bit less uh, alpha enhanced. And then the remaining principal components here, that's basically just noise in the data sets. So uh, not so interesting anymore. So to first order, you have these fundamental correlations here. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail about what that might mean. Uh, just uh, say for now that sodium is, uh, is quite a complex element, as we saw with the um, uh, different enrichment processes that can, can be important. You can reproduce the, sense, the trends of sodium versus iron in the Milky Way uh, in some basic models. So here from the recent paper by Chaki Kobayashi and her collaborators. Um, but I have not seen any elements that real any models that are able to explain very well the differences between, let's say, the Milky Way and the dwarf galaxies. Um, here are the measurements uh, for the globular clusters. You see these uh, differences in sodium abundance that tend to be anti-correlated with the differences in barium. That was also evident from uh, the principal component analysis, right? You can see sodium goes up here, barium goes down. And there's a hint perhaps that the M33 globular clusters uh, stand out here a little bit by being more sodium depleted and more barium enriched. But barium is quite hard to explain. You can see uh, the models here actually do not do a great job of reproducing barium even in the Milky Way. Okay, so I think that's also something that would be interesting to get some more input from, uh, from theory about here. Now, okay, on to... Uh, X8 or EXT8. This is this a very metal poor globular cluster that we found more or less by accident. So we had uh, last year an observing run where we were trying to get more spectra for M33 globular clusters, but we had about an hour at the beginning of the night where we were waiting for M33 to rise high enough above the Keck pointing limit. So uh, we just went to the, to the catalogs of M31 globular clusters and looked for a fairly bright compact one that was not too close to the disk. Um, and so we picked this guy here, X8. Um, and that turned out to be uh, quite unexpectedly interesting. Um, now, as you already saw, it is very metal poor, but maybe I provide a little bit more context here to uh, give you some idea about uh, why that is so interesting. So there has been for quite a long time, at least 20 years or so, this notion of a possible metallicity floor for globular clusters. Um, <clears throat> and the point here is that if you take the metallicity distribution of globular clusters in the Milky Way, you don't find any clusters below this limit here of about minus two and a half. Um, then you can ask yourself, of course, is this, uh, is this significant or not? 
we don't have a whole lot of field stars down at low down at those low metallicities either. So it may just be that you're just running out of stars and globular clusters. Um, but if you extrapolate using some uh, reasonable assumptions or maybe just fitting some simple chemical evolution models, um, what you find is that uh, there is probably about a handful of clusters expected down below this limit here and none are observed if, if you would just extrapolate based on these simple models or based on what you see in the field. So that has given rise to this idea that maybe there's a metallicity floor. Um, uh, last year, Mike Beasley had a paper where he also compiled data for other galaxies. And again, you see this floor here at minus two and a half. Each of these uh, box and whiskers plus here is a uh, data for different galaxies. This is Milky Way, we have M31 and a few other galaxies there. There are a couple of clusters that maybe fall down below here. All those, all those also tend to have large uncertainties. So at this point, it was not really so clear uh, whether uh, that was in conflict with this idea of a metallicity floor for globular clusters. That's the observations. Uh, what could you say theoretically about this? Um, this is uh, from a paper that is still in progress uh, that I'm working on with Mark and with uh, Else Starkenberg as well. Uh, but there have been other papers recently exploring this idea. Uh, that the globular cluster metallicity floor might have something to do with the mass metallicity relation for galaxies in the early universe. Uh, so the basic point here is that uh, metal poor galaxies are also expected to have very low masses. So you have the mass metallicity relation and uh, it seems a uh, uh, like a reasonable uh, idea that you cannot form a globular cluster in a galaxy. Uh, which is more massive than the galaxy itself. Uh, so let's have a look at some galaxy mass metallicity relations. They have been converted here to a luminosity metallicity relations by comparison with the globular cluster data. We could also just have converted the globular cluster luminosities to masses that would have given you a similar kind of plot here. Uh, but what you can see here is that uh, down to metallicities of about minus two or minus two and a half or so, there is no problem. Galaxies are more massive than globular clusters, so you can form globular clusters uh, easily in, within galaxies up to quite high masses. But once you get down below this floor at minus two and a half, uh, the ga galaxies themselves actually become too small, it would seem to form globular clusters. So uh, it could be that it is simply the galaxy mass metallicity relation that set this uh, maximum globular cluster mass. Uh, these are specific uh, galaxy mass metallicity relations from this paper by Choksi. Um, that was also used actually in Dieterich Kausen's paper from uh, last year that shows basically the same thing where he explores this idea again, just plotted in a slightly different way. So this is now showing the maximum globular cluster mass that you could form at a given metallicity uh, here with the redshift uh, dependence coded in as a function uh, here along the x-axis. Metal rich globular clusters, no problem. But once you get down to minus three here, you would expect that the most massive globular clusters that you could form would be between 10 to the four and 10 to the five solar masses, depending on uh, what fraction of the material that you think you could convert into a globular cluster. Uh, so even if such a, a globular cluster could form uh, with a mass of 10 to the five solar masses, we would expect that it should have dissolved by the time we get to redshift zero. So that would again be consistent with this metallicity floor at around uh, minus two and a half, eh, which is the, the green line there. Then uh, X8 enters onto the stage. Um, these are just the raw spectra basically as they look with some model fits uh, plotted together that with them. So X8 is the blue uh, spectrum here and M15, one of the most metal poor globular clusters in the Milky Way, that's the orange spectrum there. And you can see just by looking at the lines actually that it's clear that X8 is significantly more metal poor than the Milky Way. That's true for this iron feature here. There are some uh, another iron line over here. And this is a region that also shows the magnesium B uh, triplet. Uh, you can see that the magnesium lines are actually even more uh, depleted in X8 
uh, than the iron line. So not only is this cluster very iron poor, it also has a very low magnesium to iron ratio, which is a little bit of a puzzle. If we plot uh, X8 on top of this figure that you showed before, you can see that it falls up in this forbidden region of the diagram here. Uh, so that is in a sense the conundrum and that is what made this uh, result uh, interesting uh, that you really wouldn't expect based on what we think about the galaxy mass metallicity relation that it should be possible to form objects like that. Uh, but of course the, these are mean relations there may be some stochasticity related uh, in all this. Uh, so it would be good to have larger samples of, uh, of clusters uh, observationally, but also theoretically, not just compare with mean relations, but some simulations that could give, a best, give us better statistics. I think the best that we have at the moment are the e-mosaics simulations, uh, which are basically a layer on top of the eagle galaxy formation simulations where globular clusters are allowed to form and evolve according to some physically motivated recipes. Uh, so this is from Chris Usher's work, uh, where you see uh, uh, yeah, data here for something like 10,000 simulated globular clusters in these simulations, uh, uh, mass versus metallicity. This square here again represent X8, and you can see that maybe there are a few clusters over there, but they should be quite rare. And I would also note uh, that uh, the, uh, the simulations are not really optimized to be uh, realistic at these very low metallicities down here. Uh, so clearly there's also some uh, more work to be done here theoretically. Uh, these are the abundances here, just uh, because uh, that was the main theme of the talk, right? You can see that most of the element, alpha elements, titanium, calcium, silicon, they are quite normal for X8. They are enhanced as we would expect in metal poor stars, but we have magnesium here being very strongly depleted so the question is whether this is now a signature of these multiple populations that we have in globular clusters, which are a little bit of a mystery. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about that here. It's not the main theme of this talk. One could give a whole colloquium about that easily. Um, so here's just a one slide primer to multiple populations. This is from Carreta's work, uh, where you see in gray here field stars, and in red you see measurements of stars in globular clusters. The takeaway message here is that if you look at elements like sodium and oxygen, you see that there's a large range in the abundances of those elements within globular clusters that is not seen in field stars. So there's something special going on about the chemical enrichment within globular clusters that we don't really understand what the reason for that is. So you have the sodium oxygen anti-correlation. There's also a magnesium aluminum anti-correlation Although for most globular clusters, this is actually uh, more or less just an aluminum spread. There are only a few clusters where you have significant magnesium variations. And we don't have any examples in the Milky Way of clusters that are as magnesium depleted as we would see in X8. But of course, we also don't have any clusters that are as metal poor. So maybe it's not so easy to uh, predict what we should be expecting. There are a couple of clusters that are interesting to compare with, in particular NGC 2419 here. Uh, that's a globular cluster uh, that has quite a wide range in magnesium abundance. So you can see that there are stars that go all the way down to minus one here in Mg over Fe. Uh, so there are stars in NGC 2419 which are extremely, extremely magnesium poor. Still, if you would take the average magnesium to iron ratio of all the stars in the cluster, you still end up with something that is quite a bit higher than what we see in X8. <clears throat> so um, we, I would say we don't really know yet what is going on there. Uh, it is also possible that someone will come up with uh, some clever explanation in terms of galactic chemical evolution. Um, although it's maybe interesting to note that uh, actually if we go back and look uh, again at the, the abundance plot here, you see that there aren't really any, any field stars down here that match the location of X8 X8 in this plot. So my best bet personally would be that this probably has something to do with multiple populations, but who knows. Uh, uh, I think I'm uh, basically uh, at the end of the talk here. Um, 
there are a few slides here that just show that we are trying to extend this work to galaxies beyond the local group. This is from the PhD thesis of Svea Hernandez that she defended uh, now a couple of years ago, where she used X shooter to look at Centaurus A. Here are the alpha elements. Here is sodium. Uh, uh, by and large, the globular clusters in Sen A behave quite similar to what we see in the Milky Way. Uh, the hope, of course, is that once we have the next generation of large telescopes available, we will be able to uh, explore galaxies like Sen A in, in much more detail. Uh, so a lot of the work that we have been doing here on the local group should be also seen in that context as well. Um, so establish a reference sample to compare with more distant galaxies, but also, of course, to develop the analysis techniques uh, that we would like to apply later on. So I will skip this. Uh, you can ask me about young clusters if you want, uh, but uh, I will just put up the conclusions here. I would say the work that I've shown and also similar work done by other groups as well um, I, um, uh, gives us some confidence. This kind of analysis from integrated light of global clusters and we can reach a level of accuracy uh, that is comparable to what we can get for individual stars. Um, there are still, of course, refinements to the technique like non-LCE corrections and so on that we want to apply but we are going in a good direction, I think. And we are um, starting to get some insights into uh, chemical evolution at low metallicities, also in external galaxies, uh, which is a regime that is a little bit difficult to probe in other ways. Um, uh, and what we see uh, in the alpha elements is that uh, actually the differences are very small, if there are any, but there are hints of potentially some interesting differences in some elements like sodium, barium, and copper and so on. And then of course I have shown you the result for EXT8, uh, where it is quite interesting that now we know that at least there is one globular cluster below this uh, suspected metallicity floor. Uh, and I think I will leave it there. Um, and uh, just uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk, Sorin. For the people following the talk on YouTube, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please post them in the YouTube channel and their speaker will answer them later.